Marking its 40th anniversary in 2022, Blue Door is the largest emergency housing provider in York Region, providing life-saving support to children, youth, adults, seniors, and families at risk or experiencing homelessness. Along with offering emergency housing and housing retention support, in the past two years, Blue Door has expanded its service offering to further work toward preventing and ending homelessness through inclusion, the first supportive housing program for two SLGBTQ plus youth in York Region. Construct, a social enterprise by Blue Door, providing supported skills training to help youth and adults break barriers to employment and secure meaningful careers in construction trades and launching in 2022 a health hub which will include a nurse and in-reach system navigator to help people regain the health and well-being needed to secure and retain permanent housing. Join Blue Door's mission and become part of the solution by learning more at bluedoor.ca. We at On The Way Home would like to acknowledge the original stewards of whose lands this podcast is recorded on. In York Region, we recognize we're on the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe peoples, and that this is the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit. And in Vancouver, we acknowledge that we are on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, Squahomish, and Tsleil-Waututh, whose presence on these lands continue to this day. Welcome to On The Way Home, a podcast dedicated to the issues surrounding homelessness and the incredible experts making a difference in the lives of homeless people. Remember to subscribe to the podcast anywhere you're listening and share it with a friend. Welcome to another episode of On The Way Home. I am your host, Michael Braithwaite. Uh, My day job, I am the CEO of Blue Door, but this podcast, we do a partnership with a wonderful Canadian Alliance and Homelessness. Uh, And did you know that CAH has the largest conference in North America coming up soon uh, in November. And maybe you want to, maybe you have something to share like our guests today uh, that we can learn about. So check out their website at uh, caeh.ca, uh, May 16th. By the time you hear this, it'll be a little late, but I'm hoping that you've put in your, your uh, uh, applications to present. But hey, if you can't present, maybe you want to sponsor the conference. It's a great way if you want to reach out to people in the sector, sponsor that conference. Or if you just want to attend, it's the best of its kind. Uh, You have people from all over the world. This year it's going to be held in Toronto. But if you can't make it to Toronto, you can join virtually as well. So check that out. And check out their Build for Zero work that they're doing. It is uh, amazing. It's it's contributing huge to getting us to uh, functional zero with homelessness. So check out ceh.ca. And while you're checking out websites, go check out my organization, Blue Door. We're doing some cool work. We have a social enterprise called Construct. And really what that is, is for the longest time we were putting youth in in jobs and other people in jobs that maybe didn't have a lot of meaning, that didn't pay a living wage and wondering why it failed. So we're doing things a little different. Uh, The trades industry is booming. We need to build hundreds of thousands of houses. Trades people are retiring. So we need to replenish the trades and we are the people to do that. So in our program, we are really a construction company with a social purpose. And listen, hey, we launch people into the trades where they start at $21 to $28 an hour. Coincidentally, that is what you need to rent a one-bedroom apartment in the GTA. So it's preventing homelessness, which is pretty darn cool. And they do high-quality work at a very fair price. So check out Construct. It's one of the ways that Blue Door is preventing homelessness, among many other programs there as well. But let hey, I don't want to keep our awesome guests waiting uh one of the great things about this podcast and it being virtual as we record this is we could talk to people all over the world there's great stuff happening across uh, our country in canada there's great things happening in north america but there's great things happening all over the world we've had guests on from finland norway um she's only the uk of course um, we talked to people in wales about the the duty to assist and great stuff happening and today we have a special guest from Australia. And as we record this, of course, we don't record live. It is about 7.30 uh, p.m. on a Thursday, and we were talking to our guest who's in Australia at 9 a.m. So I'm so grateful uh, uh, to have this guest. Now, let me tell you first about the organization that our friend uh, Peter is going to join us in a minute is from. So and if it looks like I'm reading it, it's because I am. Uh, Anti Shelters Work, and they are not a shelter, but it's called Anti Shelter. Uh, as they are the peak body for affordable housing and homelessness. Uh, it involves research and policy development, advocacy and communications. 
sector consultation, coordination, and capacity building. They represent and promote the important work and interests of all their members across the affordable housing and homelessness sector with a view to achieving better outcomes for Territorians without access to appropriate and affordable housing. So super important work. And with us today is the Executive Officer of NT Shelter. Uh, we have Peter McMillan. And Peter is an experienced executive with senior leadership roles across manufacturing, mining, and the nonprofit sector. So a different kind of mix, which is awesome. Uh, we can learn so much from every sector. Prior to joining NT Shelter, uh, Peter was Executive Officer at Regional Development Australia, RDA, Central West. This is his second stint in the NT. Have you previously lived and worked at Groot uh, Elant, and, and hopefully Peter will tell me if I said that right, for three years, Peter has professional qualifications in commerce, international business, and supply chain management. Peter, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Michael, for having me. And uh, yeah, look, I think you uh, got the rough end of the stick doing the night broadcast while I'm here at nine in the morning. <laughs> so great. Thanks well, for having me. I'll tell you, we did one before. So the, the prior uh, incarnation of this show, we had a show out of the blue. And we talked with, uh, you know what, now we're going to think, I, it escapes me now, but it was around um, the upstream program in Australia. So we talked, oh. I think it's David, um, and David McKenzie. And so we talked to David oh, McKenzie, right. and we really messed up the time for him. I think it was 4 <laughs> o'clock, it was 6 a.m., so poor David. So we thought, we, you know, to be fair, this was a good meeting point in the middle. We, uh, we always start the show with the same question for every guest, because there's similar themes but a little different for everyone because it has a personal meaning and peter i want to ask you what does home mean to you michael that is such a deceptively simple question i <laughs> you know it's something i think about a lot um because you know some people will have an experience of of growing up and living in the same place or the same state or province for all of their life and it's very clear to identify i guess a locational aspect to that so for me, not having lived uh, in the same state or province for 25 years now, people often ask, you know, where's home for you? And for me, I think that aspect of location is important because I consider Darwin to be my home now, having lived here for five years. It's not a long time, but it's the sense of community and connection and neighbours as well. It's all of that for me. But of course, it's also the physical aspect of having shelter, having a roof over your head, and I think having that ability to control your own living space, to be able to decide, you know, like I could actually live in this, you know, where it's 50 square metres or whatever it is, you know, I can watch what I want on TV or won't have people coming through, uh, into, you know, bothering me or interfering with me or losing that privacy aspect. So I think it means so many different things. Um, and again, I guess for our First Nations people, it's also that deep connection to country and, and uh, song lines and so forth. So there's many, many different layers to that question um, but for me a home is all of that I'm not an indigenous person but uh, for me it's definitely a sense of, of location of connection and the physical structure that's around you yeah it's so interesting you say that um, about the connection piece because quite often I think for the longest time it was hey as soon as we put someone in a, a home with you know four walls and a roof our, our job's done and what we found of course we learned hopefully through our failures is that that connection to community is so important and i say that because in emergency housing or shelter they might be there they've got as say at blue door they'll have 25 buddies they've got staff that care they have meals that are coming there's a sense of community and we put them in housing they're all alone no meals coming no one's asking when they're you know so sometimes they self-sabotage because the sense of community is not there and it's so important so thank you uh for bringing that up no worries thanks no it's, it is important you're right uh, Peter, can you help paint a picture of what homelessness looks in the Northern Territory of Australia for our listeners? Okay, so the Northern Territory of Australia, first of all, it's a, it's a territory um, that's in the north of the country. Uh, it uh, encompasses around, I think it's, I've got my notes here actually, 18% of our land mass. So it's a very large geographical part of Australia. Uh, for those who are, who are more familiar maybe with Sydney and Melbourne, those are our major cities on the eastern seaboard and, and most of the Australian population lives on the seaboard. But in the Northern Territory we have only 240,000 people, right? So we've got about 1% of Australia's population spread out over 18% of our landmass. So you can imagine the remoteness aspect to 
a lot of people um, who are living up here most live in Darwin, the uh, capital city of the Northern Territory. It's very close to Asia, uh, to East Timor and Indonesia, only an hour by plane from here. And, um, but in terms of homelessness, it's terrible. Uh, there's no other way of putting it. Uh, we have 12 times the rate of homelessness uh, nationally. Uh, we have 88% of homeless people are Indigenous people, Aboriginal people. Most of it is in severely overcrowded housing. Around 80% is severely overcrowded housing. Not uncommon to have 20 or more people living in a house, uh, a three-bedroom traditional house, for example. So there's a really big push at the moment to address that. Uh, and all of the issues that um, your listeners may be familiar with, with overcrowding, so the issues that that has on health and well-being and, and, and the difficulty in getting uh, access to a good education uh, and so forth. So a lot of our communities, we have a lot of remote and very remote communities that are difficult to access during our, our wet season. So in the north of, of our territory, it's, it's, a, it's a wet and a dry season, it's a tropical, uh, tropical environment. And so during uh, essentially six months of the year, it's very difficult even to get out to those outlying communities. So the infrastructure is poor, the quality of housing is very poor, and there's been very little investment in housing um, really uh, for many decades now. It's only starting to, to turn that around. So around 54% of our Indigenous people living in uh, remote communities are living in overcrowded housing still to this day. Uh, there is a lot of investment happening at the moment, but it's going to take a long time to, to get that right. In the meantime, you know, we have, sadly, we have uh, First Nations people experiencing uh, illness and disease that's entirely preventable, like rheumatic heart disease, that was really abolished in most of Australia uh, in the 1920s or 30s. It was the sort of disease that our grandparents and great-grandparents would have had. Um, but sadly, it's still, it's still endemic in many parts of the Northern Territory, as are things like trachoma and skin uh, sores and uh, otitis media, or those inner ear infections. So there are a lot of real issues with living in houses that aren't functioning uh, where they need to be, where it's difficult to get repairs and maintenance done in a timely way, and uh, where there's just the, that access and um, uh, infrastructure challenge. The other thing too is there's just simply not enough funding and money going into the system, Michael, which is probably a, an issue that we see in many sectors across the world in homelessness, just, just that investments, it's not enough. It's not really uh, getting the outcomes that we need and it's so preventable. Uh, absolutely. And you know, the interesting thing is, I think sometimes, and this might be simplifying it, but uh, when it comes to this being a priority for government or elections, uh, many of our most vulnerable don't vote, right? Or, or don't have access. You, you, you mentioned that word a couple of times access to housing, access to health care, access to be able to vote if you don't have an address or there's overcrowding, right? So, so it doesn't become an election issue or one that they're focused on to get them elected. So hence, uh, and, and I don't know what happened uh, in Australia, but in Canada during the pandemic, what we saw, that message of stay safe, stay at home was, was you know, for impossible if you're experiencing homelessness. So we saw massive quick event, uh, investment and political will to house people and we did it we did it quick like hotels were bought things were bought. so it just goes to show if the investment's there this sector can move fairly quick was it similar in australia oh look absolutely you know michael the similarities between canada and australia are quite striking in a lot of ways i mean if you think i think it's just the province of nunavut um i'm not sure if i pronounced that correctly but you know where you have a lot of the same issues that we that we're grappling with and that i guess that push towards greater uh, self-determination of housing in, in Indigenous or First Nations communities and a lot of overcrowding and, and op but a lot of opportunity and potential and you know that's why I came to the Northern Territory. Uh, my wife and I came here five years ago because we saw the, the potential of this place. It's a beautiful part of the world uh, but there are so many infrastructure shortfalls and I, I mentioned the word infrastructure because I think that's a real opportunity now in Australia where our leading infrastructure agency uh, which is Infrastructure Australia, surprisingly, they um, they have identified for the first time the importance of housing as key social and economic infrastructure. We we want to grow our economy, we want to grow our population, we want to you know we want to uh, you know we want to basically 
have economic growth. We're not going to be able to do that if we don't have that housing in our regional areas. But we do have a federal election on at the moment, Michael. I'm glad you mentioned that because um, we do have housing featuring quite prominently now uh, in the conversation from a couple of different aspects. One is investment in homelands, which are those, uh, they're not, I guess in the Northern Territory we have urban centres, we have about four urban centres. We have a number of, uh, I guess what we would say is remote communities, which are small towns, uh, with quite isolated, and then we have homelands, which are, I guess, more traditional um, houses in a country uh, where First Nations people live, which aren't generally serviced. They might run off generators and things like that, they're not on the grid. For the first time in many, many years, there's now talk of investment in those homelands rather than going through those hub models with, with the regions. So that's that's really important, you know, getting, getting housing um, delivered more effectively, providing housing where people want to live and where they where they belong. Uh, going back to the question of what's home, so that is on the election agenda. And and the other thing that's that's starting to get a lot more traction is during the pandemic, we saw a lot of uh, Australians incurring rental stress, and a lot of uh, people left the cities of Sydney and Melbourne. Not a lot of Sydney and Melbourne, by the way, because they're, they're huge cities, but it made a big difference to the regions in having people say, you know what, I think it's safer living out in the regions. We can um, get a good education. We've got good job opportunities, great lifestyle, don't have the congestion in our major cities, good quality of life, fresh air, all of that. And we found there's just not enough housing to uh, meet the economic growth of the region. So what that's meant is a lot of people have been priced out of the rental market in their own regions. And there's been some really notable examples in, in Byron Bay and other communities on the, on the coast of Australia, but also here in the Northern Territory and elsewhere. People that have been living for, for years, in some cases, in their rental, have been, and, and excellent tenants, have faced increases in rent of around $100 to $150 per week and been forced to leave because they just can't meet that, uh, meet that rent. And now there's a lot of discussion around that in the context of a federal election. So this is an opportunity there's no doubt about that for us to highlight the challenges that many Australians are facing. Certainly those that don't have any housing, uh, the homeless, those that are increasingly at risk of homelessness, and also those, uh, you know, key workers or moderate income earners that are um, increasingly finding it difficult to find anywhere to live that they can afford. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, quite often we have food banks. We don't have, say, a housing bank to back that up. So people will pay for housing. Uh, one of our major food banks in the city of Toronto, uh, they do an annual survey and they found that families that are using food banks on average at the end of the month have $9 left over for food and everything else. Uh, racialized, black and indigenous uh, people using the food banks, families have six. Like, so it's just uh, you know, abysmal and it grew 47%. Uh, over in, in one year, lots of lots of uh, comparison with Australia. When you were talking about the Northern Territory, absolutely, I thought of Northern Canada and yeah. the access and the infrastructure. And we actually had uh, a member of Parliament, so an MP, who was up there, who said, "I live with my parents. I can't afford housing. That's how bad it is." Right. And the story she heard, she actually didn't run again. She said, "I just, it's just, you know, r run her down." Uh, so lots of things. So let's talk about anti shelter. And as like it might be a little misleading when I say anti shelter, you're not actually a shelter providing shelter, uh, but you bring together some partners. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? How did it come about? How does it uh, operate? What its main purpose is? Sure. So we were set up in 1992 as a peak body uh, to represent uh, the interests of uh, member organisations that are providing uh, frontline services to. Uh, homeless people, those at risk of homelessness. So those are some accommodation providers and uh, all of our members are charities. So uh, we've got some uh, excellent uh, frontline service organisations up here that provide services directly to, to clients uh, and also in that um, homelessness sector as well. So people that provide um, assistance, whether it be mental health, uh, housing needs, counselling, domestic family violence and so forth. So. Uh, it's, uh, we've got about 35 organisational members. Our job really, we, we only exist, Michael, basically to represent them and I figure if we're doing a good job in our, our advocacy and representation and, and building the, uh, 
organisational capacity of our sector, then, then we're doing our job. And, and that's really been, I guess, my focus for the last five years, just trying to make sure that we're getting those uh, fundamentals right. And, you know, Michael Jordan says, for example, you know, the importance of fundamentals, it's, it's everything, right? You can't make the fancy shots before you can keep possession and hold the ball. And I think that's very true in what we do. So we really tried to get the fundamentals right with our messaging, seeing, trying to understand what our members need what do they see as being the best opportunities to, I guess, address homelessness by providing the right infrastructure, whether it's a crisis shelter or more additional beds in, in facilities or particular services that can be delivered that are going to really make an impact, whether it be to, to you know, young kids that we're finding in increasing numbers, uh, the couch surfing or, or sleeping rough, uh, leaving those um, overcrowded homes and coming to the cities, I was telling, mentioning before, uh, so our job really is to tell government, uh, all levels of government, so we have a, a Commonwealth government and a, a Territory government, uh, similar to your provincial government like in the North West Territories, which has a lot of similarities too, uh, and also local government. We, we try and get um, more, we try to get better outcomes for people uh, who don't have a home. So our vision is really safe, affordable and appropriate housing for all Territorians. That's what we, we do. It's interesting that um, that we're funded by the Northern Territory Government. I, I always find this a little bit, still find this a little bit, um, uh, not confronting or perplexing, but it, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that you know, the, the, the organisation that provides our funding is the organisation we're often critical of in the media or, or when we're going to them, saying, look, we, need, we simply need to do better in this. But I think what we're trying to do is just to be authentic and, and get the evidence around um, the impacts that homelessness and housing is having on people, also on their budgets as well. I mean, we have a lot of people that uh, you know end up in hospital, in emergency departments, in the mental health system, in the correction system. And uh, some uh, academics uh, in, I think it was 2017 in Melbourne, released a report that estimated a cost of around Australian dollars, 25,000 Australian dollars uh, a year uh, for each person that's homeless, that's a cost that could be avoided by providing a bed. So we're blowing money, right? Uh, at the moment, we're wasting it on all of these um, treatments and where we could be really preventing a lot of those costs from even incurring. So the penny that has to drop, I think, for uh, policy makers uh, is that a dollar invested today in housing and homelessness is going to save you a dollar fifty or two dollars or three dollars. Maybe it's 20 years down the track, but the longer we defer that, uh, the more costs we're passing on to future generations. And the less prosperity and opportunity will our young generations have. They won't have the access to good health outcomes. It's, it's, it really needs to happen now. It's, it just seems like a, such a, um, a short-sighted uh, view uh, of this space, Michael. Absolutely, I love that you're talking the prevention language. Uh, a couple things happened actually in Canada. So homelessness, of course, always existed, but not to the state. It, it, in the 90s, the federal government of Canada stopped building housing. They just stopped. They were building thousands of units per year. They stopped. And you just see the escalation of homelessness. Now we're trying, they're back in the game. They've got a national housing strategy uh, since 2017, but it is a slippery slope back as you're talking about. I like how you mentioned too, we have three levels of government. Now the federal government might say, we're going to put X number of, billions of dollars in housing. It has to then go through the province to decide, which might be a different type of government. And the municipalities make all the zoning and different rules. So if they're not on board, nothing happens. So the provinces here may not translate here. So it is a very complex system to get all three working together. And as you said, I mean, the other thing about short-sightedness too, is what we found is we've, we've heavily pushed prevention. And I think for a lot of politicians, they may say, "We listen, I have a four-year mandate. People are going to say, what did you accomplish in those four years? So when we talk prevention and say, to your point, look, invest now. Not only are you saving lives, you're saving dollars. Not right away, but down the line. Sometimes they say, but what do you have right now? Like, what can, a house I, I build, I can tell people we just house someone. So it is a bit of a tough sell, but you mentioned too, data, data changes minds, right? We need the evidence. We need the data to show. It's eerily similar, you know, uh, in Australia to, to many of the things you've just mentioned. We don't even have a national housing strategy at the moment. That's one of the things that advocates across Australia have been pushing for for, for a long time now. 
and there may be a change in government, in which case they've, uh, they've indicated they will have a national housing and homelessness strategy. Uh, if you don't have a plan, it's hard to, to, prog to progress, despite everyone's best intentions. But the thing also is that, that we see is that it doesn't have to be the Commonwealth Government or the provincial governments or local governments that are putting all the cash to build housing. There's, there's a lot of housing that has to be built, there's no doubt about that. But Australian superannuation funds at the moment are investing in housing in the US. So they're not investing in the Australian market because there's not an investable product that represents um, you know, acceptable risk and modest returns that they're looking for. So we're trying to think of how can we get other investment into housing uh, on a, I guess, a public partnership uh, basis, private public partnership basis, where we leverage all that money that is available. Australia's a very wealthy country, similar to Canada. You know, we're the 12th most prosperous country in the OECD. We can afford this. We can afford to build houses to, to, to get people out of homelessness. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, but we just got to find and be creative and think how can we get um, you know, business and government saying we need to work on this problem because it's, it's in everybody's interest. And I mean, you know, businesses, uh, they need to thrive and prosper. I've worked in business before. We, we want to have livable communities and we want to have uh, communities that are safe and have good amenity. But to do that, and you know, if, if people have issues with, with rough sleeping, well, guess what? We can, we can eliminate that quite easily. If, uh, if, that's, uh, if that's seen uh, as being a priority for not just our sector, uh, not just for government, but for the business community and investors as well. Um, there's a lot of potential there. Uh, in our case, unfortunately, one of the challenges we have is that because we're only 1% of Australia's population, we only receive 1% of the money, mm -hmm. which is ridiculous, really, when you look at the amount of, of need that uh, we have in Northern Territory. Australia has 3% of its population is Indigenous. Uh, in the Northern Territory, it's 30%. And I mentioned before the impact on housing insecurity and homelessness for First Nations people here in the Northern Territory. We've had years of, of under, underinvestment. Um, we don't have a big economy. Uh, we, have a mine, we have a lot of mining and, and other industries, but we don't have the economic prosperity of some of the biggest states down south who... Right coincidentally are getting all the lion's share of the funding. So we are really uh, wanting to get that corrected after the election. Yeah, I mean, you, again, many parallels where, uh, you know, in some parts of Canada, there's not clean drinking water, which is horrifying. I mean, drinking water, uh, access to, to health care, and, and just not only is there not enough housing, the housing that's there, much of it is de deplorable, right? So we've got to do better. Uh, in, in so many different areas, including in my area, which is north of Toronto, in York region, a small percentage of the population is indigenous, but of the percentage that are experiencing homelessness, I think it's around uh, 27 percent. So so way overrepresented, um, and we, we have to do better. And we've got some great indigenous, and it's indigenous-led, so we've got some great Absolutely. indigenous organizations doing that. You know, uh, for too long, we had non-indigenous people trying to to provide solutions to indigenous people and it, it, it didn't work, right? You mentioned the very beginning, which I loved. Uh, we, uh, just a few years back, we had one definition for homelessness and indigenous leaders said it's different, right? You mentioned the connection to the land, the relationship to the land um, and nature. And, and so um, Jesse Thistle, who uh, almost died on the streets, uh, went basic, committed a crime to go to jail to get health care. Um, and in jail, learned to read. Uh, was then went back to university, and within six years, from I think it was 2010 to 2016, earned his PhD, and now has written a book. If you've ever read it, uh, from the ashes, it's an incredible book. But he helped craft that with the Canadian Alliance on Homelessness, the Indigenous uh, definition of homelessness, and it's quite beautiful. Absolutely, and and I guess one of the one of the proudest things. One of the things I'm most proud about over the last five years, if I can say this, I guess, is that we've managed to um, get a memorandum of understanding in with a newly created Aboriginal housing peak body. And it's just so important, right, that First Nations people get to speak about their housing and, and, and what they need and, and their aspirations and what housing and community should look like, how it should be built. You know, having more community living areas or, or veranda areas for, you know, for uh, extended families 
having having the right design rather than having you know the traditional mainstream housing model that's not uh, culturally appropriate. And so we're very proud of the relationship we have with Aboriginal Housing NT and, and maybe in a couple of years time once they get their feet on the ground uh, it might be very interesting to hear about their journey and what they're trying to achieve for Aboriginal people uh, in, in those regions that look people like me don't have any authority Michael to speak about to be honest about what they need it, it has to be Aboriginal led we want to see Aboriginal housing back in Aboriginal hands absolutely nice nice to hear that so what what's other what was the future for NT what are you excited about uh, what's going to happen you've been you've been doing great stuff for five years what's the next five years look like We've got a, a heck of a lot of work ahead. There's no, and there's no doubt about that. This, this is, this is very hard yards, really. You know, it's, it's got, it's a jurisdiction that's got the biggest housing challenges with the least fiscal capacity to, to meet them. Right. So we need, we need more money to flow into our system. We need to address remote, overcrowded housing. That's going to be, uh, it's going to be decades probably before that's rectified. It's a lot of money right, that's, that's required to get into those communities. We believe we can tackle homelessness. We've got a minister who's now um, very supportive of growing the community housing sector. Uh, that's a very important part of the picture. So rather than just having the, the provincial government um, deliver housing, we've got, um, you know, we've got registered um, not-for-profit community organisations that are that are expert in managing housing, getting a chance to grow their businesses here in the Northern Territory and working closely with Aboriginal people uh, in the process to, to transfer those skills across. So there are some green shoots, I would say, but fundamentally we still need to get the um, basics right with having a national housing strategy, a pathway to providing housing at scale in our urban and remote communities, and I guess above all, a determination to end homelessness. And when, when I think of inspiring leadership, I think of Jacinda Ardern over in New Zealand who said, you know, it's, it's, she's basically gone on the record to say that, you know, New Zealand is a prosperous country. We've got the prosperity and the empathy to end homelessness. You know, that's what we need from leadership to say, you know what, this is not acceptable in a prosperous nation like Australia or, or New Zealand. Uh, to have these levels of homelessness, to have women fleeing domestic family violence, sleeping in a car, or, or returning to the home where the perpetrator is if there's no housing for them. That's not acceptable. And, uh, but until we're hearing that being driven uh, by the highest levels of, of all levels of government and community leaders, we're not going to get the results that we know we can achieve. So this has to be a priority for government. Now, I mean, well, last question I could ask you: What is like? So I, I wanted to, the understanding of homelessness to the average Australian. Because I ask you that, one of the challenges we find across Canada usually is Canadians are empathetic. Uh, they, you know, they want to help. They want to do more. But if you ask, what does homelessness look like? They usually describe street homelessness. So it's funny. Well, actually, they're they're very cautious. So if you, I, I went to a, a class of grade three once and asked them what homelessness looked like, and they described me. They said, you know, old guy with a, a beard, you know, so uh, yeah. sitting on the corner. And I said, well, you know, well, well they're not wrong. Like, there, there's a lot of that street homelessness. However, um, you know, it's much more than that. It's not a look. It's a feeling. It's, is it similar in Australia? Does the average person, would they, in what they've seen on TV? So I think the average Canadian, when they know, they take action. But for many Canadians, they have no idea that there's 250,000 Canadians on any given night without a safe place to go home. Well, that's really interesting, Michael. You you asked that because yesterday I was I was giving an interview to uh, one of our media outlets that's got a specialty in, in health, right? Uh, calling from Adelaide down down in the south parts of Australia, and, and when I told her what homelessness looked like up here, she just said, "Wow," you know, like "Wow." Didn't have any idea of, of what it, what it was like. And for me, growing up in in a metropolitan community south of Sydney. For me, homelessness was, as you described it before, it was typically a, a male, a little bit older, uh, on a park bench in the city, uh, or sitting under an awning of a building uh, in the dark with a bit of cardboard and a blanket. That was what homelessness meant when, when I first, as I, as I was growing up, I guess those were the images that I formed. And I had no idea uh, when I moved up here for this role uh, what homelessness really was. And all of those people that are couch surfing or not sure where they're going to sleep tonight or tomorrow night 
uh, and the people that are in overcrowded housing. I mean, I didn't really grasp what overcrowded housing was. I'd never really seen it. Uh, it must have been on television when I was a kid, but I, for whatever reason, I didn't connect with it or um, really get it. But there are so many different forms and guises of homelessness. You know, we have a lot of people in Darwin that come here from outlying communities as visitors. Sometimes they run out of money and get stuck. Sometimes they end up homeless. And they might even get, you know, in 10 years' time, they might get a house in Darwin. But people refer to this notion of spiritual homelessness for First Nations people. And that's where their country is. That's where their heart and soul is. So it means so many different things on a lot of different levels. Yes, thank you for that. You know, it, it's we can learn so much from each other. Uh, we've we've taken a lot. I know Canada has taken a lot from Australia on the different lessons learned, things that work. I think we don't have to. There's this push for, for uh, there was a fund in Canada for a while by our Canadian government for innovation uh, that was never tapped into because they they define in, innovation had to be brand new. No one has ever done this before, mm-hmm. and, and and then quickly had to change their minds to. It hasn't been done here or done this way. Um, so yeah, there's so much we can learn from each other. If people want to learn about the awesome work you're doing uh, at NT, where can they go? Best place to go to will be to our website. So that's www.ntshelter.org.au. Uh, we also are, are present on social media, so through Twitter and Facebook. Um, Get our newsletter, subscribe to that. If you want, if you have stakeholders or, or listeners who want to uh, contribute, uh, either in kind or financially, then there are ways we can do, direct that to our member organisations to make sure assistance gets to the people who need it at the at the at the coalface, so to speak. So, um, yeah, check out our website. We would love your ideas. We would love uh, your innovation. And I'll just point out, as you say, it doesn't have to be something brand spanking new or creative. It can just be working together in ways that we haven't before, sharing ideas, um, asking each other what works and what doesn't work. And, and Michael, I really appreciate the opportunity to come on this program and and, uh, and and I guess tell a bit of our story of what we're trying to do over here in the Northern Territory. A long way away, but a lot of a lot of things in common. You know, we've got a Melville Island as well. You know, we've got a Northern Territory and you've got a Northwest Territory and there's a lot of similarities there. So hopefully we can keep this conversation going. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Peter. I hope that in your case, you're going to enjoy the rest of your day. I'm going to enjoy the rest of my evening. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And uh, yeah, like you said, let's keep the conversation going. Uh, We're excited about what's going to happen at NT in the, the coming years. Thank you so much for having me, Michael. Well, there you have it. Another episode of On the Way Home. Uh, it's so amazing to me to, to talk to people across the world. Listen, we have the same, we're, we're dealing with a lot of the same uh, challenges that might be slightly different, uh, but we can learn so much from each other on solutions, uh, especially with countries like Australia and Canada, around our healthcare systems, our housing systems, infrastructure access, all those different things. And, and we learned a lot today. So you know, check, check them out ntshelters.org.au uh, hey be a part of the solution give back to them get involved if you have ideas share them another great guest another great program and another great episode of on the way home we'll see you next time